Blending realities. Holly, I would like to begin with what we have here on set today. Um, and let's, let's start with that one. What is that and how did you make it? Well, that is a mixed media piece. It's called Awkward Rider. And it's the accumulation of about, I guess, almost 40 years of the way that I work of putting together material. I start with paint and then I bring in other materials and I form basically a story. And when I start out, I don't know where the story's gonna go. I just start. I have over 200,000 photo files that I can use as information, plus I'm always taking uh, photographs. And this is about my starting to horseback ride again about five years ago. Because I'd always been around horses, always had horses, but then as an adult, I gave it up. And then when I started riding again, it wasn't the same fluid, easy thing it had been when I was young. And so, as an awkward rider, um, this, was, this is what I felt like when I got on these huge horses and it seemed dangerous and <laughs> sort of scary, and, but at the same time, thrilling. Titling a piece of art, how important is that to you? And do you think it matters to the people who see your art? Oh, absolutely, it matters. I don't come up with a title usually until I'm about two thirds or done with the piece, and then it will come to me. But I think it's a clue um, for people to to find out more about it. I think that people need to have some sort of inroad into what you're doing. The title could almost be thought of like a door then. So Absolutely. what is the door for this piece? Well, this is called Supplicant. Um, this was done around 2017. These are fairly, fairly recent. And in this case, it was just, I had this beautiful blue background. And then the, the body of the, of the chair and the legs of the horse are, are all made from things that I painted. But Supplicant is about petitioning something for something important. And so I think that horses have always been these kind of mysterious big animals that they do things for you. It made me think about being of service to each other. So can titles yeah. and perception of your work, is that sort of up to the viewer? Well, I think if, if it's good, I think you should be able to bring your own agenda to it. Um, let's talk about one more piece. I, I understand this one's called Making Rain. It just seems like living in the Southwest, and especially now in the last 10, 15 years, our extreme weather is drought. And so I think it's something that's always on my mind. And then uh, my husband and I lived in Zuni for eight years. And of course, they have these rain dances. And they were just beautiful and powerful. So I think in my art, there's this asking for rain. And that's what, this is called Making Rain, this piece. And it's really about petitioning the gods to give us some rain. And uh, like the Zunis had their dances, I have my paintings. And they come up every year or so, I'll do a, a rain painting. Does it make it rain? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> You are known for combining photography and painting. What makes those things go together? I think what happened was, was I was one of the first people to kind of do that, to, to take photography, which was just becoming accepted as a fine art media, and then take paint, which the photographers were just terrified of paint. It was like, ah, but I wasn't, I was too dumb. I first started painting over photographs and then changed to putting photographs on top of the paintings. But there's something about the reality and the non-reality that's very powerful. You have the reality of the photo with the non-reality of the marks of the paint or, or the things that I make up and put in. When I start out, I had the idea of a horse 
So I was basically looking at the body first, and I had lots of different uh, material that I used to try and form the body of the horse. And this is Early on, your work was described as abusing the photograph. Um, how, how did you take to sort of that label or that phrase being applied to what you did? I actually gave it to myself. Okay. I just love it because I, because again, I think that I was sort of the darling of the photography world for a while because I think they were all so excited that I was just beating the heck out of these photos. I mean, it was cutting them up, I was taking them apart. And I'm really not a great photographer. Um, but I was able to take these photographs and make them be something else. By cutting them up, by transfiguring them and transposing them, they become something that was more powerful. I, I'm interested in how you begin. Is it a theme? Is it the mediums? Is it looking around your collection of paints and photographs? How do you start? With well, I think I'm a looker. I, I start with a painting. I take paint and I just throw it around. I paint outside because it's so messy. Um, and it's like the, there's a fairy tale of a, little, of a little girl and she puts on these ballet shoes and they're magical and she dances and dances, but then she can't stop dancing and she has to cut her feet off. And I sort of feel like that when I paint. I just can't stop. I just I go and go. I won't go to the bathroom. I won't get anything to eat. I get paint everywhere. So that's what starts. I make these, I make maybe 20, 30 background paintings and then I'll come in and I have all these photographs that I have too many almost, I mean they're so deep, but I'll, I'll begin to take them and lay them out and cut them up and put them down and see what happens. And then I'll begin to follow a storyline that it will begin to make sense. And I'll maybe work on maybe five at a time and I'll put them up in the wall. They may take a couple of months to finish, but I'll be constantly adding or taking away. And then at some point they're done. How do you know when you're finished? Your stomach stops hurting. <laughs> How have your concerns or fears or anxieties about the world influenced what you make? I think I'm a naturally anxious person. Um, and so I think that's what comes through. I'm, I'm not someone who, who does happy, joyful work. I do work that, that connects with that deeper, darker side. Um, although I think it's often funny stuff too. I mean, I think there's humor to it. But th that's, that's how I, approach the world. That's how I see it. I'm a glass half empty kind of person. And so that's what I connect with. Has that changed over time? Ha in other words, has the world gotten crazier and you've gotten calmer? I've gotten calmer. I've gotten saner. I've gotten psychologically healthier. But the world has gotten crazier and crazier to the point that you just don't even want to watch the news because it's so bad. So I'm, I'm a much happier person. When I look back at some of my earlier paintings, I think, wow, <laughs> you know, that's pretty intense. But so yeah, it's flipped. The world's worse. I mean, maybe the world was bad all along and I just didn't see it. But. So in 30 plus years of doing this, what have you discovered? God, I, I think it's an ongoing discovery. I don't think it's an end. I don't think you go through the door and there you have it. I think you're always opening doors, opening doors, opening doors. And every time I do a piece, I think I can never do another good piece again. You know, I'm done, that's it. So I think it's, it's as simple as that. There's no big, big aha moment. I want to know more about that. You think you're done at the end of every piece. How do you start anew? In your hands. I think your hands get going. They do whatever, write or make, you know. And I think that's for why painting's so important for me because it makes my, once my hands take over, then my head can go out and, you know, like smoke a cigarette or whatever. But my, my hands are in charge. That's my creative self. It's, it's letting my unconscious take over because mostly our consciousness are in control. So that allows me to, to have this more powerful thing take charge. So I do not feel comfortable when I look at your art. I wonder if that is a common response from folks who talk to you about what you've made. What is the feedback for the most part? Well, mostly I'll get it sideways. Um, 
uh, people will, I'll, oh, oh, that one was really scary. And I'll think, what? <laughs> but mostly people aren't too polite to say that to you. And, and usually when I have a review written, it's positive. You know, it's talking about the complicated things that it's saying. So I don't really hear that that much, but I think it is an, a common thing. And mostly I think people don't, don't look at it and feel comfortable. But the ones, the people that do, not only do they not feel comfortable, but they're also laughing or they're also feeling excited and, and intrigued and interested. I hope, I mean, that's what I would hope. But it's, yeah. it's a little bit that moment of laughing at the wrong moment during the movie. <laughs> I do, in, in cruising your catalog, I think I did that a couple yeah. of times. Yeah. Uh, so what do you want people in the end to take from what you've made? Well, I, I want them to love the work. I don't want them to feel separated or anxious or you know afraid or uncomfortable, but it's what it is, and I can't control that. I mean, that's the thing, I'm not in control. I'm only the hands that do the bidding of the unconscious directive. And so if we're gonna do something that's scary, okay, well, we'll do that, so. One time a gallery director told me that snakes and red never sold. So for about six months I just did snakes and red, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so. so art not as an act of manipulation, but potentially at least as an act of rebellion a little yeah, bit. Yeah, or somehow that creative self saying, I'm gonna do exactly what I wanna do. So 